Lord like the Ascension Day. It's heaven. And so as we come now to speak about these teachings, we want to get our Hebrew Bibles out. And we want to uh, we want to turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 2, or let's see what we're doing, 6 through uh, 14. And of course, as you know, we haven't translated the, uh, the Hebrew Bible into Cherokee yet or uh, other uh, languages. So for this morning, we're going to use uh, the English translation uh, only for the Hebrew Bible. So 2 Kings 6 through 14. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for God has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as God lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet... If you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father the chariots of Israel, and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own claws and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah, which had fallen from him, and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is God? the God of Elijah. When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other. And Elijah went over. Our readings from the New Testament today is uh, Sequisa 1, 15 through 23. Sequisa, which is Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Nazgi, Iyazdi, Nazquo, Ayam, Aqua, Danga, Na, Ejo, Iyu, Sa, Uga, Wiyu, I, Jisa, Ale, De, Sige, Yusa, Na, Ni, Na, Una, Da, Na, Ti, Udla, Yiji, Su, Li, Gogo, Una, La, Na, Hi, Ji, Ale, Li, J, Ha, Ni, Hi, Nadigales dos di Gia nihi Ija nis di Ska Gado do lis di Ska i Nazgi Pune la nahi Giga jeli Uga we yumi Chisa galone da Uja liga Aga yandi de ge Galako di u jis Ga jis gi Nazgi, EG, Nadi, Ada, Nado, Agado, Anis, Dodi, Ale, Adana, Nago, we see, Nizgi, who are some, EG, Gado, Anis, D, Nazgi, Na, Ejolis, Dodi, Gason, Dakana, Ega, J, Jadis, Da, Nadi, Nazgi, Ijaga don't ahisto di 
Nazda, Urdagi, Gadi, Gaysan, Nazgi, Urdaya Nadi, Gaysan I, Ale, Niga, Angala, Kor, Diyu, Gaysan, Unada Nati, Unale Kaili, Yaliz Dati, Gaysan, Nazgi, Janadi, Jigi, Ale, Nazda, Wada, Gona, Dada, Ikohiya, Gaysan, Uluni Gaga, Gani Gaysan, Niga Nela, Iga, Igo, Iya, Nahi, Shizgi, Nazgiya, Dula Ways, Dani, Uja, Tanahi, Ulaini, Gide, Da, Gaysan, I, Nazgi, Galo Neda, Gina Da, Nela, I, Uyohasa, Jidale Tani Ale Uwasan Agati Sedi Plan Juwe Kani Gala Ladi Digai Sani Atli Galada Diyu Isge Isga Po Naniha Digaga Nailodi Gesani Ale Ulini Diyage Sani Ale Gagi Nayon Gesani Ale Pune Gawi Yu Sadihi Gesani Ale Nini Dunado Adisan Digo Hani Jizi Ugla Aniko Uasan Gohi Jigi Naspo Sigi Ninahani Asi Ulei Lohis Di Jizgi Ale Nada Lesan Gohaz Di Dulagan Laskan Hawi Nidi Klan Jini Da Wane Lan Ale Nizgi Ugawi Yasadegi Jina Gan Lan Nada Lesan Gohaz Di Juna Nelodi Unadar Plaka Anehan I Nazgi Ayeli Jizgi Nazgi Ukalihi Nazgi Uwasan Nigadeyan Niganada Akalihi Jizgi And for those who don't speak Turkey, you can turn to Ephesians Chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of Jesus, the God of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know God, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for us who believe according to the working of God's great power. God puts his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at God's right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all the things for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are all grateful Jesus went to heaven, right? Now the ascension of Jesus 
it was not the first time that an ascension had occurred. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, there are many stories of ascensions. And I just read you one from 2 Kings, which is, was the ascension of Elijah. And that was very different from the description of the ascension that we find in Luke, which talks about Jesus speaking to the people and then walking away. And while he's walking away, he is ascended into heaven. But now, uh, so we don't really know from the writer's perspective what the horse is and the... Uh, and the, and the fire, the cart of fire, is really all about. The chariot of fire was really all about. There is a great deal of speculation that maybe it was a UFO, all these other things, but really, right here, right now, in this context, none of that is significant. What is significant is that when it comes to ascending into heaven, going into heaven, that uh, God empowers people to be able to make that happen. The question is, do you really believe that you will too be ascended into heaven? We see in the, in the reading from 2 Kings that Elisha, the prophet who took over for Elijah, seemed to lack confidence in this conviction. He was really freaking out about Elijah being taken away. Of course, we don't want to lose anybody. Any of us want to lose anybody in our lives, but in this context, it seemed like where in our reading in 2 Kings, he was really deeply concerned about having to follow in Elijah's footsteps and not being able to do it. In this sense, we see the reading that, you know, he wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit put upon him so that he would have the confidence that he would need to be able to carry on. Likewise, you know, uh, we see a similar aspect of this in our reading from Ephesians today where the lack of confidence that which we saw in Elisha in taking over for Elijah is also shared by the by the uh, the people in Ephesus because here we have Paul writing this letter to the Ephesians and he's talking about having assurance in God's power that Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven using God's power just as Elijah used God's power to perform many great and wondrous things in his day. And then it was passed on to Elijah. So also too we see that from Paul's place of context that he is reminding the people of Ephesus that this power that God has bestowed has now been taken from just the few and through Jesus been given to the many in particular us and especially in the context of this letter to the Ephesians Paul was reminding them that the power of God the power that Jesus used that Elijah used that Elisha used that many other prophets used was handed down to Jesus from Jesus was passed out to all those who believe. Now this is really important right here. One component that we see here that is kind of interesting is how both Elijah and Elisha relied upon the mantle to part the waters. Same thing with Moses. He had the staff. You know, he struck the water with his staff. And the, part, and the waters were parted. This is what is considered relying on an external power. That you're expecting something else to be empowered. You know, there are a lot of people, and I know this is controversial, but you hear me out on this, there are many people who like the Harry Potter movies. 
And in that sense, you know, in all seven of those movies, or eight of those movies, we see that each of the little witches and wizards had a little bit of power within them to maybe do a little bit. But it took an external power, the wands or whatever else that they used, for that power to be strong, to be focused. They had to rely on an external source for that power to be used. And yet, when we look at the life of Jesus, we don't see external power. We see internal power. The power emanating from within him, radiating out all around him, even permeating the clothes that he was wearing. And we know this from the story of the, the woman who was hemorrhaging and was facing death and who so humbly just touched his cloak and was cured instantly. That power was not external. It was radiating out from Jesus. The reliance upon God's power from within instead of God's power from without. God had imbued power on objects for Elijah and Elisha and many other prophets to use, including Moses. But when it came to the Jesus, God imbued Jesus with that power. And that power was passed from Jesus to us, within us, and not without us. In our Indian religious tradition, we trust and we honor the different different aspects of the world around us represent certain teachings, certain cultures, certain ways. And we know that if we bless something, that it becomes sacred. We imbue it with power by the grace of our Creator. I learned long ago from the medicine elders who taught me in our Indian religious tradition as a Native American Christian that nothing is sacred. Nothing has power unless we make it so. Because God has given us the power now, and not the objects. We are the ones who create the sacred space. We are the ones who are used to do the healing, to do the curing. We are the ones who have to have confidence that God has bestowed this power within us in order to make these changes outside of us. Paul affirms this in Ephesians for the power of God and says that all believers have these gifts that God has bestowed this upon each and every one of us. And what does that mean? Believers. What does that mean? You know? I know for myself what it means to be a believer. I believe in the fire. I believe in the living presence of our Creator. I believe in the sacredness of things. I believe in honoring the sacredness of God in all life. I personally know these things. That is my life experience. And God has used me despite my own character defects, flaws, whatever you want to call them, to do many things for many people. And I'm grateful for that opportunity to be of that service. But we all have that ability within us if we believe. And that's a choice. That's a choice we make every day. And it all comes down to whether or not you trust Jesus within you. Do you really believe that Jesus is alive, is living within you? And do you trust Jesus? Today we on we think about the ascension that is going on think about what it represents. It is the symbol of God's choice to share God's power of co-creation within each and every one of us. And how we use that power or disuse that power or misuse that power is what we are responsible for and we 
deal with the consequences, both good and bad. Those that we like and those that we don't like. But they do come. God has guaranteed us that they will come. And in a reading that we did earlier from the Reverend Dr. Broker Lanniston, we know that God gives this freely to us. We know in 2 Corinthians that, I'm looking for my reading here. We know that in 2 Corinthians 9, 9 through 11, that God freely bestows upon us great gifts and that we have a responsibility to share those gifts. To trust that heaven is within us and all around us. Because that's what it means to have God's power within us. That we are the co-creators of heaven. We are the ones who choose to decide to take right action to create heaven upon earth. To manifest heaven right here, right now, for those to come for the next seven generations. That is what we do. That is our responsibility. And the sources of power that we have at our disposal are our heart, our mouths, and our hands. How we use them is up to us. If we use them to do good to ourselves, to our families, our community, or if we use them to put ourselves first and foremost above all things relying on outside things, external things, to bring us happiness, power, whatever. These are the worldly things that Paul speaks about so many times that remind us that these are not the things that, that God wants us to focus on. What God wants us to focus on is the power within ourselves. And through that power, we are in power to make a difference. We remember, remember now as we think about whether we have the confidence to believe in these things that it is a baby step kind of thing. You know, you got to practice it. You got to practice it to get really good at it. I spent a lot of years going in front of the elders how to do these things right. And so you have to practice to get it right. And you have to trust that it's all going to be for the best thing. Best for everybody. One day at a time. We have to do it in a good way, setting a good example for others to follow. It can include many different aspects, many different aspects. Jesus was a troublemaker. He challenged the status quo. He fought against social injustice. He advocated for the poor. He advocated for the homeless. He advocated for the suffering and the dying. He spent his whole life helping him to improve the quality of lives for all people. And then he gave us the power to do the same. So if we call ourselves believers and we're not doing likewise, are we really believers? Are we really walking our talk? And that's a challenge that we face to this day. Right now in this country, racism is on the rise. Oppression is on the rise. The number of people living in poverty at or below the poverty level here in the United States is the highest it has been in over a hundred years. There's a huge disparity growing between the rich and the poor. And I mean the really poor. We're especially right here in the Midwest and the South. And so we have to ask ourselves, how can we truly be believers knowing that we're creating hunger and poverty and oppression? How can we truly be believers if we're not doing something to change it? Do we really have the confidence in God to use the power that has been given us to do right, to do what is best for everyone and not just ourselves? This is a question that God's going to ask you, so you might as well better start coming up with a good answer, because you are going to get asked. Count and always remember that God does provide us with the source of confidence that we need to use the power that has been bestowed upon us 
to take right action to do the next right thing. Creating heaven right where we are. Walk in beauty.